It seems to me that the preparations are focused on day one and then for a few months subsequently. Um, just if we could stand back a little bit, I, I think it was Pascal Lamy who was before who said that uh, we might be able to prepare in the short term, but it's when divergence occurs yes. that the problems will yes. really stack up. I mean, is that your view as well? And, uh... a- absolutely, and, and actually I, I think there's been <clears throat> too little debate around the three, six, nine month period. So for us, for example, you know, we will have a temporary tariff on food, but how long will that temporary tariff last? How sustainable is it to last? SPS checks on goods coming into the UK from outside the EU, it's not sustainable not to administer those checks because surely the <coughs> New Zealanders and the Australians who are acting as third countries and exporting food into the UK would say, why is our food being checked? Mm. And European food is not similarly being checked. So mm. I, for me, I think the, there's the immediate disruption and dislocation around the 1st of November, which will have serious consequences, particularly in fresh produce. But actually, for the consumer perspective, there's so much uncertainty from not having a robust deal with our biggest trading partner. And there's no getting away from that. The EU, you know, 80% of food imports into UK supermarkets come from the EU. Mm. So probably about 25% of everything we sell comes from the EU. A fraction comes from the rest of the world. And actually only, I think about 10% of the products we sell currently attract a tariff, which is probably 10% of imports, which is probably about 3% of the products we sell. Mm. So all of these, these are like really big questions that need to be answered quite quickly, because otherwise they're gonna have a huge impact on consumer prices going forward. And it's not manageable to do, you know, we cannot, I mean, all what we've said always, the best thing for consumers would be a good deal with our immediate trading partner with the EU. That should be the first consequence of the Brexit, and then you move on to trading partners after that. But for food, it's such a, it, we are so reliant on that EU trade that we need to secure that really, really quickly. And of course, the dislocation of going with a no deal may make that trading arrangement harder going forward and to get a deal as well. Um, yeah, I think it's, uh were saying, I mean, uh, part of my role uh, when I was there was to look at all scenarios, whether it was deal or no deal. Um, Inevitably, we ended up spending much more of our time on no deal because it was the one thing that we could actually pin down and know what the plan was. Um, Whereas deal scenarios and including what happens after day one Uh, the longer term scenario after a no deal, do you carry on having a no deal or do you actually subsequently get a deal um, after that no deal because obviously you're still trying to make a trade arrangement? The problem was, and probably still is, lots of people want to plan for those scenarios, but what scenario are you planning for? Mm. And what um, um, what is the best set of scenarios that you should plan for. So that is the difficulty. I think everyone uh, in government is trying to uh, work out. So in Ireland, for example, it was clear that both the customs regime and the tariff regime would both be not sustainable long term. They would both therefore only apply for a short period of time. So therefore, what's the plan after the short period of time to get out of that? I'm sure people were thinking about it, but it wasn't clear what the solutions were. Because once you know what the solution is, you think, well, why don't I go straight to that? And that isn't obvious. Um, So there's absolutely people worrying about it, but I think it is actually quite hard to pin down because it's not known policy. It reminds me of uh, a colleague of mine who used to say, don't start a fight in a pub unless you know where the back door is.